Today's speaker is Professor Lucian Hardy. Lucian Hardy received his PhD at Durham University in 1992 under the supervision of Professor Ewan Squires. His thesis was entitled Non-Locality, Violations of Lorentz Invariance and Wave Particle du Duality in Quantum Theory. After his PhD, Professor Hardy held various positions, for example, at the University of Oxford, the University of Innsbruck, and La Sapienza University in Rome. Lucien Hardy is now a professor at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Professor Hardy has contributed enormously towards our understanding of the foundations of quantum mechanics. Via Hardy's paradox, he has also contributed towards our understanding of our lack of understanding of quantum mechanics. Furthermore, by his work on realizing quantum teleportation, etc., he has paved the way towards technological utilization of quantum phenomena. Today, we are very excited to hear about his novel work on quantum gravity. So, with those words, Lucien, thank you very much for joining us, and, and the virtual floor is yours. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and thanks for the um, invitation as well. Uh, so, I'm going to share my um, screen. Um, uh, I should mention while I'm doing this is that the, the, the house next door is having some construction work done, and so you may hear a bit of banging now and then. And, and you may even hear our dog barking if she gets very excited about the construction work. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to use uh, effectively an overhead projector and I'll, I'll, this talk I'll, I'll um, write on uh, paper. Um, so I have a few slides prepared, but mostly I'll just write on paper. I'm, I'm very happy to have uh, uh, questions during the course of the talk. Um, um, so um, so let, let me start. So um, the the problem of quantum gravity. Uh, is to find a, a physical theory uh, which uh, approximates or, or limits in some sense uh, to general relativity on the one hand and to quantum theory on the other hand. So this is you know, theory of quantum gravity, and we want it to approximate uh to quant to general relativity on the one hand it has to be has to approximate general relativity in those cases where general relativity has been confirmed experimentally and likewise uh to quantum theory on the other hand and again it has to uh, limit to quantum theory approximate quantum theory in those cases where quantum theory has been confirmed experimentally and this is it's kind of a tricky problem because uh, we know there's two less fundamental theories and we want to get up here. So what we really want is is so that the arrows going in the opposite direction. Uh, but from a method from a methodological point of view, it's difficult to know how to solve this problem. There's no um, there's no um, algorithm, at least not not one I'm aware of, uh, for going from two less fundamental theories to two to to a more fundamental theory. Um, but we can look at these two theories and ask, uh, you know, what kinds of features do they have? And um, uh, and so um, you know, if we look at um, general relativity and, and quantum theory, we can see that they each have uh, conservative and uh, radical features that are, in some sense, uh, complementary. Um, so uh, general relativity has the conservative feature; uh, that it's the deterministic theory. If you specify um, uh, completely um, some boundary conditions then all the physical uh, uh, quantities are uh, determined. Uh, and it has the radical feature that the, um, the causal structure is dynamical. Uh, what I mean by that is, well, in general relativity, you have to um, you, you determine the metric. Um, and you determine the metric by solving uh, 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 field equations. Um, and um, those uh, and the metric you get depends on the distribution of of, of matter, um, and, and so it's something which is dynamical. It's not fixed in advance, and that the metric itself determines um, the causal structure. So, for example, if two events are, are space-like or, or time-like, if these two events are space-like or time-like, it is given um, uh, by the metric in the vicinity of these events. Uh, quantum theory uh, is conservative in that the causal structure is is fixed, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, and it's radical uh, in that um, 
it has uh, it is in some sense fundamentally indefinite. So what I mean by that is um, if, for example, you have a particle which can go through one slit or another, uh, then in some sense the particle goes through both slits at once. Uh, uh, there's there's no answer to whether it goes through one slit or the other. That's an, it's an indefinite uh, property. Uh, it is correspondingly, uh, uh, in some sense, inherently uh, probabilistic, because if you look to see which slit it goes through, uh, then you will find it only going through one slit, um, but with some probability. Um, so, um, so it seems that um, um, we, we have a, a choice here, um, uh, and the choice is, you know, what, what about theory of quantum gravity? Which which of these properties will it have? Now, it seems that once you've let these radical uh, elements um, uh, into your physics, it's very difficult to see how they will go away, and so. So um, it seems that what we need is um, is we need a framework for um, for theories that um, uh, have dynamical causal structure and are indefinite, uh, and also it has to be a probabilistic framework. So we need a framework for theories uh, which have um, uh, indefinite uh, uh, causal uh, structure. Um, and uh, what I mean by a, frame, a framework is, you know, often when you're formulating so, the... Uh, I, I had a question in the chat now. Oh, yeah, please, please go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so there is someone who asks, uh, how about uh, reconciling gravity and quantum mechanics if you consider quantum mechanical... Uh, theories that are not probabilistic, i.e. Everett? Oh, okay. Um, it's a very good question. Um, so, so Everett is in some sense deterministic, although from the point of view of uh, an, internal, an internal observer, it, it appears to be probabilistic. So certainly, you know, internal observer in, in, a, in an Everett described world will, will use probabilities. Uh, and, and I'm taking an operational approach uh, so, so really, I'm taking this kind of internal perspective, um, uh, and so probabilities will still appear uh, in in that case. Um, um, but it may be that um, the sort of deeper theory is nevertheless consistent with um, some kind of determinism. Um, and um, I mean, this is a sort of general methodological question. Uh, since since I'm pursuing this uh, operational uh, approach, I haven't gotten to that yet, but you'll see that. Uh, you know, is 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 this operational approach meant to, to deliver you the, the fundamental theory? Um, uh, and and the, the the perspective I take is that operationalism is a sort of methodology for getting you to a fundamental theory. It's not necessarily the fundamental theory in itself. You know, you see something similar in, in the work of Einstein in moving towards uh, special relativity. You know, he he had these very operational ideas about how you measure time and 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 distance, uh, and he was able to get to um, to special relativity, which you know eventually took a, a much more, you know, in the work of Minkowski, took a more a more sort of ontological sort of uh, 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 it was formulated in a more ontological way. So um, yeah, so there's that sort of methodological point. There's also theories like the de Broglie Bohm model, um, which are um, deterministic in in a different way from the from the many world. So they're deterministic in the sense that if you have complete information about the the state of the universe, um, then um, then um, you, you you then there, there aren't any probabilities, um, and it's possible that you could pursue an approach to quantum gravity based on the on the on the de Broglie Bohm uh, model, uh, which was uh, sort of which was deterministic here, and then you'd have to think about what you did over here. Uh, that that's not the, the approach I'm trying to take, but it, but but that example does serve to illustrate that 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 maybe fundamentally this is not the right approach so so i'm 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 making a choice here okay yeah so thanks for the question um so yeah so I th so the the point i was just making um was um we, we're finding a, a, a framework um and within that framework we want to construct a physical theory so um you know you, you do that by adding principles and postulates and so on um and and and, and using some sort of argumentation you, you can see something similar again 
in, in the work of Einstein. But this time, when he was um, deriving general relativity, you know, he started with this uh, Riemannian calculus, the sort of picture of tensors living on uh, manifolds. And in that mathematical framework, uh, he was uh, able to get to the equations of general relativity by um, by imposing various sort of principles and ideas, uh, and you know, a fair dose of uh, uh, just sort of, uh, intuitive reasoning. So, um, so, so that the the idea is that maybe something like this framework I'm going to uh, tell you about could play a similar a similar role. Okay. Now, I promised you I was going to mention um, uh, how fixed causal structure appears in quantum theory, and it's kind of interesting. Um, now if you just if you just take the point of view that um, quantum theory is a um, is a theory where you evolve a state forward in time, um, then you have you know, some um, so you have some um, state living on a on a space like hypersurface, uh, and then you you just evolve it forward in time like this. So um, so in that case, the um, the space like hypersurface in, in, in distances across here are space like, and, and, and going from here to here is, is time like, um, and that means that you have to have fixed causal structure because. Um, you know, if you have indefinite causal structure, then this just wouldn't be true. So if you're in an evolution um, picture, um, then you're relying on some fixed background causal structure. Um, and there's another perspective you can take on, on quantum theory, where you also see that it has a uh, fixed causal structure. So imagine you have a, uh, a circuit, so you have various um, boxes with systems passing through them. And I'll just show a small part of some circuit. So here's something like that. Um, and you're interested, imagine you're interested in, in what is the appropriate mathematical object if I'm talking about A and B taken together. Well, in quantum theory, what you do then is you take the tensor product of the, um, of the, um, of the operators associated with the evolution for A uh, and the evolution for B. So something like this. Uh, these would actually be the super operators. Um, what about if you're interested in regions uh, or the, in, in boxes B and C? Well, in that case, you take the direct product of, um, of, of um, operators associated with these regions. So this is different from this case. And there's another example uh, which you can consider is if you're interested in region uh, B and D. And in that case, you can define something, I'll call it the question mark product. Uh, and this is defined so that when it acts on some other, some, uh, some operator like this, you get D, C, B. Okay. Uh, and this, you, you can expand this into a, into a sort of a, a full definition. So this is a this is um, a product you can take uh, as well. Uh, and you can see that each of these products are quite different. Um, and um, the one that you choose depends on the causal structure. So A and B are space-like separated, uh, and so you use the tensor products. B and D are time-like separated, but they're, uh, they're causally adjacent. So, so one happens after the other. Um, and so in that case, you take um, a sort of direct uh, product, uh, whereas B and D are, are also time-like separated, but there's a gap in the middle. And so you have to use this other product that, the, uh, that I call the question mark product. So you can see that in order to talk about uh, quantum theory in this way, you have to refer to some fixed background causal structure because the kind of causal structure you have uh, determines um, what kind of uh, product you use. Okay. Um, so before I continue, so I should maybe um, mention, just give you just a few pointers to stuff, uh, to um, a few references. Um, so the, um, the, the, the framework I'm going to talk about is the, the causal framework. 
Uh, and this is something work I, I started in 2005. It was it was kind of a, a, an offshoot of work I did on deriving quantum theory from um, from what I called reasonable ax axioms. Uh, and I wrote a paper in 2005 and a few papers uh, subsequently. Uh, recently, uh, my student, uh, Nitika Sakawada, Uh, has, uh, has uh, completed her PhD thesis, so it's uh, this, this year. Uh, and you can find this if you search uh, online at the University of Waterloo. Um, and um, and in, in this thesis, she, she developed the, um, this causal loop framework. And in particular, uh, she developed some diagrammatic notation. And I'll use the, some of that diagrammatic notation uh, uh, during this talk, because I think it helps uh, see what's going on uh, more easily, um, and um, and then the subject of indefinite causal structure and indefinite causal order is something that uh, really took off in the literature. Uh, in particular, uh, it took off uh, following um, uh, two papers. One was by Kiribella et al. So Kiribella, Dariano, uh, Perinotti, and Valeron in 2009. Uh, and uh, they, they talked about, they, they found a, a, a sort of more quantum-like framework, so it's different from the causal loop framework, um, in a sense that it was more specialized and had operators, operators in it. Um, and they also demonstrate, uh, they talked about a, a, something called a quantum switch, which is a way to actually get indefinite causal order. And then also there was work by um, by Reshkov uh, um, et al. Uh, this was Reshkov, Koster, and Bruckner, um, and they um, did something similar to Bell's inequalities. They found some inequalities for the situation where you have definite causal order, and then showed in a framework they developed, which was similar to the one that Kiravella et al. had developed. Uh, that you could violate those causal inequalities. Uh, and so from this work, which was to some extent influenced by uh, this earlier uh, operational work on, on the causal loop, um, uh, um, there's a massive literature coming out of, of, of that work. Um, not much work has been done directly on the causal loop approach. Um, recently, uh, like a few years ago, uh, Adam Lewis and I um, wrote a paper on quantum stuff Uh, and the idea there was that you have some some quantum stuff. So we visualized, we imagined it like as if it was some kind of plasticine, which could have arbitrary lengths. And you attach electrodes, or you attach some kind of um, wires to provide um, classical inputs. And likewise, you attach some wires to have to read off classical outputs. And you sort of time gate this. And the question is, can you? Um, can you make this um, perform uh, quantum computing? So in a paper, we had a, a machine learning based algorithm to, to see if you could force this uh, to be a quantum computer. Uh, and some of the proofs in that paper uh, rely on the causaloid uh, approach. Uh, one reason for that is that the causaloid approach uh, is very general. It doesn't rely on having a circuit uh, in the background. And so it's very useful for this kind of situation. Okay. Um, the basic idea of the causal load approach is that there are three types of compression. Physical compression. Um, and these are, um, these were given names by uh, Nitiga. These are tomographic. Um, compositional and meta. Um, if you think about a physical theory, what it does generally is it tells you um, that if you know um, some set of quantities, then you're able to calculate other quantities. So all the quantities that uh, can be calculated are related. And so, so in some sense, there is a compression uh, uh, a larger set of quantities can be calculated from a smaller set of quantities. 
and uh, so I call that physical compression. And then um, if you pursue it in this particular way, you can um, you can you can sort of build up a, a framework for mathematical theories. And this framework is is a more general than, for example, the circuit picture. Okay. So before I go on to the causal loop framework, I just want to talk about um, a simpler example. Uh, and this is where you have um, a preparation for some system, and this will be a, a quantum example. So it's in some density matrix, and some, uh, there's a density operator associated with it. And, and then the system, and you make a measurement. And the measurement uh, is associated with some operator. Um, and now, um, in quantum theory, this density matrix, uh, uh, I'm going to assume it's a spin half um, system just to keep it simple. Um, so you can write down the density matrix of a spin half uh, particle uh, like this. Uh, so this is the, the probability of getting spin up along the z direction, the probability of getting spin down along the z direction. Uh, and then you have this these off diagonal components, which are uh, complex adjoints of each other, complex conjugates of each other. So, um, so, and and then a this quantity here, uh, you can show that it's equal to um, p x plus minus i p y plus minus one minus i over two p z plus plus p y sorry p z minus um and and this is not difficult to show um and what's interesting about this is um that it also relates to these probabilities and furthermore it's linear so what that means is um the, this density matrix has the same information in it as this object Uh, so if you if you know this, then you can calculate this, and if you know this, you can calculate this. And furthermore, the relationship between these objects is is linear. Um, okay. So let's just go a little bit further. Now, if you want to calculate a, a probability for a general operator. then you'd calculate it like this. Uh, and um, it turns out to be useful to me just to include an alpha subscript to label um, these possible measurements you might make. So alpha is just labeling the different possible operators. Um, so it's here. So the probability uh, P alpha, uh, when you make the particular uh, measurement that's labeled by alpha is given by this rule. Um, now, since um, these two are linear related and the trace is a linear product. You can write this down instead as the dot product of this vector here uh, with, um, with some other vector. And this vector R is determined, uh, is related to this um, uh, operator associated with the measurement. These two, are, these two are related as well. So I realize rho and P are a bit similar, but. Uh, this is a row, this is a P. Um, okay. And so you can calculate any probability um, um, if you know this P vector. Um, so one way, to one way to think about what's happening is that you have a, a physical compression, that you have a list of all possible properties over here. Okay. And these compressed down uh, in, in quantum theory to a much shorter list of probabilities. So this is an example of physical compression that I was talking about earlier. But actually, this is an example of what I'm going to what I call tomographic compression. Um, and um, you can 
you can just to see this a bit more, you can write this down instead um, as, as a matrix in, in a matrix form. Okay, so PL uh, are the components of this um, vector. Uh, and then I've just got a matrix. So this P alpha is given by some matrix, and this is a rectangular matrix. In, in, in fact, it will be very rectangular because alpha runs over a massive number of possibilities, whereas L runs only over four possibilities. Um, and L in this case belongs to some uh, set of um, of um, cases. Sorry, L is a member of a set. And that set is equal to z plus z minus x plus x minus. Okay. Uh, I mentioned uh, this diagrammatic notation that's very useful. So let me um, do that here. So this equation here, you can write it down in diagrammatic notation like this. So this. This is the probability p uh, alpha. I represent that by a circle with p inside it and alpha on this uh, leg sticking out. Uh, and um, you can represent that as a diagram. Uh, I should say, of course, this L is summed over. And then here I'm using uh, 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 the diagrammatic notation that was originated by Penrose. So when you have a, a, a wire connecting to uh, objects like this, then you sum over the um, of the uh, the index uh, that lives on the wire. So this is the same equation as this. And and actually you can also write down um, this equation. Um, really these two equations are the same, but but they have a slightly different. Um, um, slightly different feeling. So I'm going to write this equation down like this. Okay. Uh, and now uh, when we put a dot on this wire, that indicates it's associated with a dot product between some vectors. Uh, and there's even another way of writing it down. Uh, like that. Okay, so don't, don't worry too much if, if these ones are a bit obscure. The main equation I want you to focus on is, is this one here, which is just a matrix equation. Okay, so that, that's a sort of a, a sort of prelude uh, uh, illustrated by this example um, uh, of tomographic compression. Uh, and and, and, and there's a whole subject uh, in, in, in quantum foundations, this is GPT approach, general probabilistic theories. Uh, and usually these are studied in the context of circuits. This is a very simple circuit, uh, but more general circuits. You, know, you can have many boxes wired together uh, and you can um, study that uh, using this, this kind of framework um, over here. Uh, this stuff, this, this notation is, 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 is is uh, connected to the causal approach, which connects us to a more general uh, perspective. Let's just check the time. Okay. Okay. So, so I want to start to set up the um, the causal approach. Well, first of all, it's a very general framework, and you can use it in in very general uh, experimental situations. So let me just demonstrate, let me just describe a few different sorts of experimental situations to give you an idea of how this framework works. So here's an example where we have a source that emits particles and, and then um, the particle, a particle emitted by this is then subject to three um, measurements um, of spin along different, um, a different, along different axes. Uh, and the way we can think about this is, well, we have um, the source, 
um, which we can describe its setup by, you know, I'm going to call it zero. I'll come back to that in a moment. Then here we have um, um, this this situ this um, measurement here, a spin. So we'll, this is in position one. This is two. This is three. Uh, and then we have the, the the spin measurement is made along some angle, called that theta one. Uh, and then we get an outcome. It's a spin measurement. So we get plus or minus. Let's say this particular one has an outcome plus. So here I've written down all the data pertaining to this particular um, um, measurement uh, on the card. And now we move over to this one. So this is in position two, um, has some angle two and some outcome. Let's say it's minus position three, some uh, angle three, uh, theta three, three, and then some outcome. Um, okay, so there's an example. Uh, and then the first one, the first card, um, where well, you have the source and you just, uh, it really, there's nothing to this. It's just a matter of the source being properly. So, so um, we just have a card that has the position there. Um, here's another example, uh, a circuit. Um, Uh, so this uh, this circuit has four boxes in it. Uh, on each box, you uh, can collect uh, data. So the first box, you know, you collect some you collect some data on a card. So the the first box is box A, and then you have some settings. Imagine these boxes have some some knob settings and so on. So there's some settings here. Let me just do a squiggle. Then also this box may have some lights that flash or some outcomes. So then you have some outcomes here, um, and so on. You collect each each um, each of these. You collect a card with some information on it. Okay. Um, here's a, here's another situation. Imagine we have some probes that are floating around in space. Here's here's two probes. There could be more probes than this. Each of these probes has a clock that ticks, and at each um, unit interval on that clock, you record um, three pieces of data, one which is a sort of location data uh, saying where the probe is. Um, and then you record some settings, so the probe has maybe some knobs on it that are set in a certain way. And then you record some outcomes. Maybe the probe has detectors that click or lights that flash. Okay. And you and you get one of these cards at each unit interval of time. Um, and so what what's happening in each of these cases is that you get uh, at each um, in this case you get a, you get a stack of cards and each card has written on it three pieces of information. Um, the first piece of information is location. And I'm thinking of this as being a sort of space-time location, but since we want to study indefinite causal structure, it could be something uh, very general. Uh, it may not be the case that different locations have a fixed um, causal structure, causal relationship. Um, the second uh, piece of information on each of the cards are the the knob settings. And the third piece of information on each card are the outcomes. Okay, um, there's maybe one more example I can mention is if you have quantum stuff. So you have a long strip of some stuff that might have quantum properties. And then you have um, uh, wires um, that you can use to send classical inputs on and wires that you can use to send, you can use to read off classical outputs. Uh, and then you gate this and at each uh, unit interval of time, you, you collect uh, an input and output information. Okay, so each of these dots this is meant to represent um, a sort of space time diagram. So each of these dots represents um, 
reading off information at a certain position along the wire at a certain time. Uh, and now you can see each of these dots has a location, uh, sort of X, which would be its position in this uh, grid. And then you also have um, the, the settings, which is the, um, the input here. And you have the outcomes, which is the, out, the output here on these, on these wires. Um, so there's another situation. So this framework I'm going to, going to describe is, is very, very general. And then what we do, this piece of paper is getting a bit crowded, but I'll, I'll keep going on this piece of paper, is at the end of each run of the experiment, we collect a set of cards. So in this example, we collect four cards. In this one, we collect four cards. In this example, we collect many cards, and this one too. So, so we, we do the experiment, we do one run of the experiment, and we collect a stack of cards with the data written on it. Okay, I'm trying to draw a stack of cards here. Um, and uh, we have that stack of cards. We can shuffle the cards if we want, it doesn't matter. Um, and then we send the cards to uh, the man who lives inside a box. And he has a table in front of him. So there's the man. And he has a, a table in front of him. Uh, and his job is to, uh, and, and he repeat the, the experiment many times, and he sends in many stacks of cards from the experiment. And his job is to try to um, you know, extract a, a theory, extract a way of making predictions from these sets of cards. Okay. This is just a device uh, to force us to think in a certain way, to force us to think in a, an operational way. Okay, uh, there's no questions at this point. Just very clear. Uh, not yet. Yeah, everyone seems to seems to be happy. Great. Okay. Okay, that's about to change. Okay. Um, so, how, how would one go about um, uh, doing the job of that 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 guy who's inside the room? Um, well. So he has a table in front of him. So let's just draw the table, table surface. And what he can do is he can uh, have little um, circles here, lots of little circles, um, for each of the um, the locations. So, so location X here, location X prime here and so on. So for each of those X values that can appear on the cards, he has a circle. So when he gets a stack of cards, he deals them onto the table uh, into the appropriate boxes with the location information. And then you can, um, you can take collections of these circles to form bigger regions. So I, I call this an elementary region. Um, and then you can take collections of these elementary regions. So this is a bigger uh, region that has many, many circles in it potentially. And I can call that region R1. Okay, so that's a bigger region. And you could have another region over here, R2. Uh, and uh, so R1 is the union of, of X's in some particular set of the elementary regions. Uh, and then the task is to calculate probabilities. like this. So remember, uh, y are, is the outcome. So y is the outcomes on the cards in region two, given the outcomes on the cards in region one, and also the knob settings on the cards in region one and region two. So the, what this is so this is something we, we could be we might be interested in calculating, if you can calculate this kind of thing, um, then you can, um, then you, you have a way of um, doing you know, calculations that you might be interested in uh, generally. Uh, and certainly in quantum theory, these are the kinds of things we calculate. But you can see here that we're expressing everything in a much more general uh, way than we do in quantum theory. We don't have time evolution uh, uh, sort of built into the way we're thinking about this, for example. Okay. So now I want to move on to how tomographic compression works in this example. Um, 
So imagine we have um, the table. I'm just going to consider one region, R1. And then if the whole region is called R, then the region that's left over is R minus R1. Um, and we can think of what happens outside of region one as a preparation So this is a preparation outside of region one. Uh, and then we can think of what happens inside region one as a measurement. Um, I've put inverted commas here because, um, because here the, the stuff that happens outside of region um, one may not be temporarily bef uh, before. Normally when you talk about a preparation, you imagine that the preparation is something that happens before the measurement. Uh, but but that's not the case here just necessarily so so that's the reason the reason I put these inverted commas uh, and then the preparation um, has associated with it some the knob settings um, in this uh, region here and also the outcomes uh, and the measurement has associated with it uh, the knob settings and then also the outcomes. Okay. Uh, and so we're interested in calculating um, the probability Oh, actually, uh, just remember before I put an alpha just to label the different possible measurements, I'm going to do the same thing again here. So I'm going to put an alpha um, on uh, just to label the different possible measurements we could have uh, inside this uh, region. Okay, so the probability for a particular um, alpha, so that is that alpha tells you not it tells you the um, the setting choices in that region and also the outcomes. I'm going to call it alpha one because it's region one. So the probability um, for a particular outcomes in region one, and, the, and also whatever outcomes you have in the remainder, given the settings you have in region one, whatever settings you have in the remainder, uh, it's written like this, so I call this P alpha one. This is a, a joint probability. Um, if we know joint probabilities like this, um, then we are able to calculate conditional probabilities um, like that. And these these joint probabilities uh, are much better to use because uh, they tend to be linear. Whereas when you calculate conditional probabilities, you have to divide by something, and so you get I have, I have in. a question here, Lucian. Yeah, um, go ahead. So someone is asking, you talk about conditional probabilities and probabilities here, but sometimes in quantum mechanics, uh, the effect of two things cannot be represented in terms of classical probabilities, uh, or am I missing something? Question mark. Um, I, I would say you can always, the, the task in quantum theory is to calculate probabilities of um, certain outcomes given certain settings. Um, and, and, and you can always do that. And, and so those are in some sense classical probabilities, they're just numbers between zero and one. Um, what, where, where quantum theory is strange uh, is the way those probabilities are related to each other. Um, you know, they're not related to each other in, in, in especially when you consider evolution, um, they're not related to each other in, in the same simple way they are in, in um, what might be called classical probability theory, where you have dynamics and such like. Um, but, you know, in, in the end, what you calculate in quantum theory is, is, is just probabilities. Um, quantum theory is a probabilistic theory. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that's the case. And um, although I didn't go into this in great detail, uh, in, in previous slides, you know, I was showing you how um, you can write down the quantum state as, as a list of probabilities. Uh, and you can do that generally. Um, so you can entirely formulate quantum theory.
theory in terms of uh, objects that are linear uh, in probabilities. In fact, the density matrix already is linear in probabilities. It's just, it's just uh, something we're not usually aware of. Uh, so quantum theory is, is a theory of probabilities. It can be formulated in terms of uh, probabilities. Um, and um, so that's, that, that all works. Okay. So here we want to calculate this, um, this joint probability. And, um, and here we have an equation which is similar really to, to the one I showed you before for the spin half system. And the only difference there was that we had um, sort of boxes like this, but the, the, from, a, from the point of view of the probabilities, it's all the same. Um, and so we can represent this equation as, um, I'm just going to do it diagrammatically because it saves me having to write lots of equations. Um, fine. So we can, we can represent uh, like we did before. Um, uh, just like this. Um, okay. Uh, and now these things here, these L's are, um, are um, the labels and they have to live in, in some set, uh, which will label omega one. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's tomographic um, compression. All it's saying is that um, all these probabilities um, for a certain preparation uh, are, are related to each other. Um, and, and this is the um, equation that relates them. Um, okay. So now let me just, let me move on to um, compositional compression. So we have the table again. Now we have two regions. And then we also have the sort of remainder region. This pen is running out. It's okay. Okay. Um, and um, we can write down the probability. I'll do it um, here. We can put an alpha on each of these just to label the, um, the, the measurements that are happening in each of these regions. We can say P1 alpha, P, sorry, P alpha one alpha two is equal to, and this is the probability. Okay, I mean, I have space horizontally to do this. Um, it's the space, it's the probability of um, certain outcomes in region one, certain outcomes in region two, a certain outcomes in um, region R1 minus R2, given certain settings in those regions. Okay, so there's a, there's a new question here. Um, Good. Related to the previous question, does there not need to be some consistency criterion as in the consistent history interpretation for certain conditional probabilities to be defined? Um, yes, yeah, so the consistent history's approach is trying to do something different. Um, so what the consistent histories approach is doing is providing you with probabilities for situations, even when you don't make measurements. Um, so you might try, uh, in that case, you, you'll talk about um, uh, a set of possible histories, um, um, even, even when you're not making measurements at intermediate times. Uh, and um, if you impose a certain consistency condition, then you're able to uh, ascribe classical probabilities that you know add up to, uh, between zero and one, and they add up to one, uh, as you would expect, uh, as long as this consistency condition is is imposed. 
but that is a situation where you're you're ascribing probabilities to things that you don't even make measurements of. Whereas here, all the probabilities I'm talking about uh, pertain to a situation uh, where you are making measurements, uh, and so they're just classical probabilities. You would, if you were to do an experiment, you would um, you would measure this by repeating the experiment many times, and um, and looking at the fraction of cases where you saw the um, the, the, the appropriate outcome. So, so maybe I'll add like a little question to that. Um, so in uh, in terms of where you're going with this framework, is the and may, probably we'll see in a bit, but is the is the aim to have something that describes the outcomes of when you've made measurements, or is it something? Are you after something more kind of ontological that could describe what happened even when you didn't make measurements? Uh, I, I would say this this is not uh, uh, meant to be an interpretive framework, so it doesn't provide you with uh, probabilities for situations where you don't make measurements. Uh, that's not to say those questions aren't important, um, and, and you know ultimately that may be what you need to do in quantum gravity, um, but but this is this is not meant to solve that problem. This is really just a mathematical framework for calculating um, probabilities. Uh, in a sort of very general situation where you don't have to suppose that there's causal structure, definite causal structure in the background. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here we have uh, this situation. Now we just have two regions. In some sense, these two regions, you can just think of them as one region. Um, and so we can do the same thing we did before. We can, we can write down um, this, the probability um, P alpha one alpha two um, is um, you can write it down just like you did before. Um, now, before I, I put L's on here um, for for reasons. For, for reasons that will become clear shortly, I'm going to put Ks on instead. So K1 and K2. Um, so this is just the same thing I did before, except that you've now got two strands going in and going out. But there's nothing different. This is just tomographic compression. Um, and um, here we have K1, K2 are in um, are members of some set. Um, uh, and you can show that this set is um, a, is, is a subset, or maybe equal, to the Cartesian product of the omega set associated with one and the omega set associated with two. Okay, so. So the, if you do tomographic compression for each of these regions separately, you'll get an omega set. The omega set of these regions taken collect together uh, is also you also get an omega set, and that omega set can be written as a subset of this of this Cartesian product. Okay. Um, and now you can go a bit further, and you can say, well, I, I want to write this down like this. First of all, I'm going to do. compression separately on each of these um, each of these two regions. So I'll, I'll do tomographic compression locally on each of those two regions. Um, and um, that will just take me from um, all possible alpha one, alpha two pairs to the Cartesian product of um, L1 and L2 pairs. Okay, so to this set. So at this stage, I have that. Uh, and now I can compress, I can do whatever compression is sort of left over. Um, um, to get to get the thing fully compressed. Okay. Uh, and this thing here, um, 
is what I'm calling compositional compression. And it, it's the compression that uh, you have to do uh, for two regions in addition to the compression you already did uh, for each of those regions locally. And if you express quantum theory in this language, I won't have time to do that, um, then you can see that the examples of different products I showed you earlier, so the tensor product, the, the direct product, and the, um, and the question mark product, are, are examples of different kinds of compositional compression. So here we have all those different kinds of compression uh, unified uh, into, a, into a single uh, uh, framework. Um, and all that changes between those different kinds of compression is, is, is the, the, the relative size of, of, these, of these sets. So, um, so in particular, um, you can have the trivial case where omega 1, 2 is just equal to omega 1 cross omega 2. Um, and that's the case when you have the tensor product in quantum theory. It's also the case when you have the question mark product. And you can have non-trivial compression, non-trivial compositional compression, um, uh, when this is a proper subset uh, here. Uh, and that's the case uh, in quantum theory when you have the direct uh, product. So when you have causal adjacency, um, you know, box, uh, box um, B goes directly into box C, um, then you end up having non-trivial compositional compression. Um, and so, so this is really what's going on. It's the same thing happening in all those different cases, um, and it's a form of compositional compression. Okay. Um, and you can generalize this if you have more wires. I have um, you know alpha three, alpha three. I'm going to get a space here and have a wire here, and you just add more boxes and so on. So everything I've said just generalizes. Um, uh, to having more boxes, and that's still compositional compression. So you have compositional compression for two regions, for three regions, for four regions, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Let's just check the time. Oh, it's, I've been going for an hour. Um, so, so let me um, I'm going to finish off with the, the, the last form of compression, which is meta compression. And um, so I won't say much about this because of the time considerations, but um, I'll just draw some pictures. Um, so imagine you have, you know, um, for example, three regions. Uh, like this. Um, well, so then, so then you have um, some compression. One thing you could do is you could write this down like this, where first of all, you do compression on each region locally. Uh, and then next, you do compression on each region taken pairwise. So now let's do these two. And this way has to sort of hop over or under. And then finally, you do compression on all three regions. Um, so that, that's, that's one way to write this down. Now, it turns out that in circuit theories, uh, like quantum theory, and classical property theory. Um, it's unnecessary to do this last bit of compression. It's uh, you can write this down like this. Okay. 
Okay, I, I... And the same thing remains true even if you have four systems or five systems or six systems or however many systems. It's only necessary to do pairwise, to do local compression on each one and then pairwise compression on each one. Uh, so, and this, this is true in, in, in quantum theory in particular. Uh, and so you can think of this as being um, uh, leading to a kind of hierarchy. So the cases where you only need to do um, compression uh, pairwise, you can call those two comp sufficient theories. Uh, also, you can show that general relativity in an operational way can be formulated in this way too. Um, but there's a whole possible hierarchy of theories where you require maybe going up to three regions. Okay, I'm going to start writing with a different pen. Um, and, uh, uh, so you can have three comp sufficient theories and four comp and so on. Uh, and so there's this possible hierarchy of theories that uh, uh, that treat um, tr treat this compression, this meta compression, in in a, in a different way. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's that's the um, the idea of meta compression. Um, so and what that means is that um, if, if, for example, you have two comp theory, um, then you have equations that relate this um, this um, this compression. Uh, requiring only um, local and pairwise compression. So there's certain equations that crop up there. Okay, um, well, I'll just conclude. Um, what I've shown you is in some ways a very abstract mathematical framework, uh, and it's motivated by the um, idea of, um, of indefinite causal structure. You can formulate quantum theory in this framework, and when you do, you get the first, you, you use the first in a hierarchy of possible theories, which correspond to two com. Yeah, is in there. Also, general relativity is in here as well. Um, uh, but there's possible theories that go higher. It, it could be the case that a theory of quantum gravity is, um, is requires um, uh, three comp or four comp or, or something like that. Um, and so there's that. And the other thing about this abstract framework is that although it's very abstract, uh, if you're in a situation where you, you, you don't want to assume that there is a circuit in the background, uh, then you can use it to, to prove uh, mathematical theorems. Uh, and so that was something that uh, we did in the quantum stuff paper that I mentioned. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucian, for, for a really interesting talk. I'm certainly not an expert on on these topics. So it's it's interesting to see all the kind of stuff that's been happening. Um, if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A button or to write them in the chat or, or to raise your hand. Um, and I'll, I'll let people do my that. hand. Is that how you raise your hand? Uh, yeah, yeah. Crispin, go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, you 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 talked earlier about about measurements and and these probabilities arising from measurements. Yeah. So, will this would this two comp theory enable you to look at an entirely unitary no process one quantum theory? Uh, yeah, in the sense, um, I mean. If it's unitary, then what you have, this is pencil, is um, you have uh, boxes like this, uh, which have knob settings on them, um, but they don't have any outcomes. Um, and so, um, so this is box A, then associated with that, when you record, locate, you know, when you record, so your location is the position of this box, your, um, your, your settings, your knob settings, or, or whatever this specify, however, however you specify this um, box, which is unitary. So you have something here. Um, 
and then the outcome is just um, some, um, you know, there's only one possible outcome. So it's just, you can denote that as outcome zero. You know, you always see the same outcome. There's not, there's not more than one outcome. So, so you can write, you can write it like that. And so unitaries can be included in, in this kind of framework. Uh, if you want to calculate probabilities, however, then you better do some measurements somewhere, otherwise you, you, you won't have any probabilities. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was just thinking of, of some of these theories where you have progressive entanglement with, with an environment and your off diagonal yeah. terms disappear and you end up with classical probabilities, yeah. but you never quite get there. But whether, you know, that sort of um, approach would it would it fit into this, or it would still be that one box you've drawn there with the zero output? I mean, um, I mean there's a there's a sort of a, a bigger question here, which is, you know, what 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 are you doing with your your physical theory? Um, like if if you record data. Uh, uh, in, in a lab book or on a computer disk or something, or whatever, whatever we call data nowadays, uh, and then use that data to start calculating. Um, so that's the dog growling. Uh, you do use that data to start, to, um, you know, to calculate probabilities. Um, then you're in an operational kind of point of view. So you're not in that point of view. You're not as, as answering fundamental questions, but. Um, I mean, you're not, you're not answering this fundamental ontological questions, but you, you, you're, you're thinking about data. And, and that's so, you know, if you're going to publish a paper on the results of an experiment, then you've collected data somewhere along the lines and, and, and so on. Yeah, so, so those are classical probabilities have gone away and you have an actual result. Yeah, yeah. Now, you can imagine crazy scenarios. You might say, well, you know, um, someone later on is going to sort of recohere, you know, all your data uh, and, and, and the, the, and, and the, the publication in which it was um, published, and the memories of all the people who remember that data, and um, and sort of you know, and, and recover the, the the coherence that was there. So um, you could imagine some super intelligent aliens coming along and doing that. Um, and I, I think those are actually serious questions in, in foundations of quantum theory. You know, it's uh, um, um, but nevertheless, from a methodological point of view, it, it's important to also to ask you know how do you how do you correlate data what is a physical theory doing when you when you do an experiment i think others have questions now actually um so i see Crispin, do you want to ask more questions or should i go into the q and uh, no, no, I, I, think I saw one from chris long okay uh, I, I just i think the one in the q a section here we have two that were first the first question is what features of a theory define the decomp sufficiency? And then what about general relativity and quantum mechanics make them two comp? Which features do we need to add to increase the dimensions? Okay. Um, yeah, so I think what, what's happening is in um, in quantum theory and general relativity they're both theories where you 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 can have boundaries between regions so if i have some region here a and some region here b then you get this boundary between the region and, and this boundary kind of um really um on, on this boundary it really tells you all that region a and b needs, needs, need to know about each other so um so that there's a physical compression that happens that you know, region A and region B each taken separately, um, you, know, you, 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 you can do a certain amount of compression in the, in the way I've talked about. But when you put them together, it's this boundary that, that um, mitigates, that, um, sorry, uh, uh, that um, controls the, the new compression you get. Um, so it's because you have a certain kind of locality um, that, is, that is controlled by boundaries in both quantum theory um, you know, and, and in general relativity, um, that you have a, a two comp theory. It's sufficient to just take pairs of regions. Um, um, but you might imagine um, physical theories where, where that's not the case. Uh, and um, and so, so two comp would fail. Okay, thanks. And then there's another question saying, 
is this framework the most general one to compute probabilities in a quantum gravity theory, or does this framework have some assumptions? Um, well, so let's think. So any framework is going to have assumptions. So one assumption relates to the, the, the discussion I was having with Crispin just now, which is, um, um, you know, I'm assuming that there's classical outcomes and it makes sense to calculate probabilities. Uh, people have looked at um, frameworks, which are in some sense more general. They still have classical outcomes, but there are different views on the universe and you can have other people for whom the classical outcomes of you can have a situation where classical outcomes for one observer uh, might actually be um, in, in a quantum superposition for another observer. So different observers can have different classical perspectives. Uh, and the framework I've described isn't general in that way. Uh, and um, and that, that's, that's serious because um, yeah. one, one thing you can do to, to, to to go between those different perspectives is, is use um, quantum frames of reference, which is a sort of mathematical uh, I, uh, idea that goes back to Yakir Aharonov and collaborators. Uh, and, and those frames of those those quantum frames of reference can take you um, between you know, in, between those different classical perspectives. Uh, and, and there's a good reason to think that quantum frames of reference should play a role in quantum gravity. So so that's one place where the framework may not be at least may not be sufficiently general to do the job. Uh, the other place is, is is the way I've described it operationally. It, it's kind of discrete, um, and not continuous, uh, and so um, of course you might expect a theory of quantum gravity to be discrete, um, um, but but it also could be a continuous theory. So that that's that's also a a feature. Um, on, on the other hand, if you're just interested in analyzing data um, and, and looking at probabilities, then it's a really a very, very general framework. It's, um, it's hard to think of something more, more general in that sense. So um, it depends what you want your theory to do, what you want your framework to do for you. Uh, and um, and um, it may need to do a bit more than what I've described to actually come up with a theory of quantum gravity. Okay, thank you. And I think, Chris, are you on the call? Yes. Hi. Um, my question was this, this might just be my misunderstanding with this compression, but uh, if we chose to not use the compression and mm -hmm. stay with a decompressed state, would mm -hmm. that not make all of the, the different, you were like outlining decomp sufficient theories, would that then not make them all equivalent? And so we could just use quantum mm -hmm. mechanics with the sufficiently large Hilbert space to describe any theory that this this framework would describe. Um, okay, so I, I like the question. I'm, I'm struggling to think how to answer it. Um, so, the, so if you use no compression at all, no, no, no tomographic compression, no um, compositional compression, no meta compression. Yes. Um, if, if we then, chose then, to decompress sufficiently, to yeah, then then what you have is no relationships between your, your probabilities. Um, so, for example, in the spin half case I talked about right at the very beginning, uh, your, your theory wouldn't provide you with any connection. It wouldn't tell you how to calculate the probability of spin along some arbitrary direction from um, probabilities associated with, with some specific set of directions. Uh, and, and the density matrix is really just hiding that uh, inside it. So you wouldn't even really be using Hilbert space. You would be um, at a much more general you know, you'd, have, you'd have no basically no correlation. You, you wouldn't be exploiting any correlation in, in your theory. You wouldn't really have a theory because because theories have to tell you how to calculate quantities, normal quantities. That's that's sort of what they do. Um, but you might you might say, well, no, I'm going to still use some compression. Maybe I'll just do tomographic compression, um, but but not other kinds of compression. Um, and I, I suppose you could make that choice, you would, you would be losing some of the predictive power of, of the theory. Um, and even, even just thinking about time evolution is, is using um, both compositional and meta compression uh, uh, in it. Uh, I mean, because you know, these are different languages, but if you look at what time evolution is in the causaloid approach, then it involves, um, it involves composition across, across time. And it also involves um, meta compression because um, 
you know, if you evolve the state from time one to time two, and then from time two to time three, well, uh, you don't, you can just talk about um, pairwise the evolution from time one to time two, and then pairwise the evolution from time two to time three. You don't need to think about time one and time three, or if you keep going time four. So, so you get this pairwise um, um, property, which is to do with two comp sufficiency. Um, so yeah, so I think um, if you start dropping these levels of compression, you very quickly lose your, your physical theory. Um, but you could choose to do that, perhaps. Okay, so in a way, it's if you dropped them, you would you would lose kind of the physicality of it, but it might still be able to describe the system without having an idea of the kind of underlying principles that make it work and the underlying correlations. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Whether, even even saying describe a system, I'm not sure that means. Um, okay. It, but it might. It would give you a set of probabilities. Yeah. Um, that, that's what I meant. Like yeah. You and could, yeah, and it would have some measurement something. results you found. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I see. Thank you. Hugo, do you want to close the session with a final question? Yeah, sure. So, in terms of modeling this framework, uh, is there so what would the com uh, the computational complexity of this theory be if we wanted to? Hmm. Oh, good. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. That's a good question. Um, I think so. So for, for a sort of generic situation where you had, um, where you, you didn't have, you know, decomp sufficiency, where 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 where, where, where d was very high, or in, in principle d could even be infinite. You know, it, it could just keep increasing as you increase the number of systems. You could just keep making the compression. Then. Um, then I think the complexity would be very high because every time you introduce a new region, you would have matrices connecting that to all the other regions you introduced, and, and so you would get this tremendous uh, complexity. Uh, on the other hand, if you have something like two comp sufficiency or three comp sufficiency, then you start to um, reduce the number of matrices you need. Um, now, in actual in actual physical theories like the circuit model. Um, in in the circuit model where you have um, um, something like this, um, in any case where there is um, a wire connecting the two boxes, you will have non-trivial. Um, um, Compositional compression. But any case, like actually, this is this is a very simple circuit where there isn't a wire connecting them like this box and this box, then you have trivial compositional compression. And so, so I guess that's not really adding to the complexity. So as you as you have a bigger and bigger circuit, uh, most of the boxes wouldn't be connected by wires. And so this might be a way to study complexity uh, in in a sort of more general um, language, uh, um, and and. Um, and, and, and the cases where you don't have causal adjacency like this uh, wouldn't contribute to, uh, very much to the complexity of the situation. Yeah, but I haven't thought about that in any, any um, systematic way. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very interesting, yes. Go, go ahead, David. I interrupted you. No, no, no problem. I'm just going to say to everyone who's still on the call, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you again, Lucian, for, for a really interesting talk. Um, and, and see most of you again uh, next week on, on Friday.